Told me 
got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning. Hey, like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends. Burning. Free! 
of people that are not the same they're not the same you're not the same John you're not the same hallelujah brother Orlando you're not the same man you were brother Frank the insurance industry is glad you're saved today brother Esteban there's places down Mexico that have never made the same amount of money since you've been saved God has changed us He's changed us. I'm not the same man I was. Glory to God, I owe him everything. He puts the breath in my body. The blood is pumping through my heart because he said it would. I love him. With everything in me, I praise him. I thank him. He's worthy of my praise and my love. He set my feet on the rock to stay. Glory to God. This is not just emotionalism. This is not something that I lean on as a crutch. It is my everything. I believe in my, the mighty God being able to do anything. There's nothing too hard for him. I don't care what kind of life you've lived before. Brother Nick, is that true? I don't care what you've done, where you've been, what you've seen, who you've seen. God is able. He's willing. He's capable. And he's here today. He says he inhabits the praise of his people where two or three are gathered together. And there's more than two or three that are loving him and worshiping him today. Whatever your need is, would you come down to the front? We're going to lift up your need before the Lord. And let's each one please remember Brother Joel. Garcia, he is now dealing with having lost his father, um, dealing with that loss and that grief. I know what it was like when I lost my father. So let's let's show some some love and some care toward him today. Let's lift him up before the Lord. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is our comforter. It comforts us in time of loss and bereavement. The Holy Ghost meets the need. So let's lift up Brother Joel and that family, the Garcia family. And whatever your need is, if you'll come down here, we'll anoint you with oil. Church, do we believe in the almighty God that he's here now and willing to meet our needs? Let's have corporate prayer today in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy towards us. 
Thank you for your spirit that we've already felt in this house today. We love you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Jesus. Mighty God, for every good thing you've bestowed upon us, Lord. We lift up Brother Joel, dear God, and the Garcia family at this time of loss. Dear Lord Jesus, comfort my good friend, Brother Joel, dear God. Touch his heart, Lord Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost comfort him. In Jesus' name, right now, help him to be strong and take care of these things that need to be taken care of at this time of life. Dear God, each one of these good people that have come down here today with needs that need to be met. Lord, we lift them up before you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to meet the need. Whatever it is, dear God, we lift it up to you, Lord Jesus. We trust you with it, Heavenly Father. We bless your holy name. Let your will be done, dear God. Let your will be done in each life, Lord Jesus. Let healing, dear God, be found out, Lord Jesus. Let blessing, dear God. Let spiritual strength, Lord God. Financial blessing, spiritual blessing, whatever it is, Lord Jesus. We trust you with it, Lord God. We believe you for Lord Jesus.
to our seats. God still moves during the holidays, amen? He's so good, he's so good. We wanna welcome all of our guests, all of our visitors. We are so grateful that you are here. Directly following service, we will be having first steps. So if this is your first time, find Brother Mike, Brother Omar, Sister Michael. They're raising their hands, they're raising their hands. Find them, learn more about our church, get connected. We want you to be involved with us, amen? Miracle Monday is tomorrow. That's right, Miracle Monday, amen. So many testimonies have come out of this. God has moved on our needs. He, he provides, he's so good. So come at 7 p.m. to Miracle Monday, amen. Make it a priority. This is how we have revival, church. When we pray, when we come together in one mind and in one accord. On December 8th, that already passed. It is December 10th. Today is the very last day. So December 17th, we are having the Christmas banquet. Has everybody heard about the Christmas banquet? Today is the final day. No exceptions. Can you say it with me? No exceptions. You have to get your money in by today. $23 per adult. Kids 10 and under will be $11.50. If you have any questions, see Sister Michael and Sister Cassandra. But you shouldn't have any questions at this point because today is the day. No exceptions. We want you to be with us as we come together uh, in the Christmas spirit. Amen. All right. December 24th, we're having a candlelight service. Let's celebrate the birth of Christ together. Pastor's going to have a special thing that he has. So you don't want to miss. Make it a priority. It's only the 24th. We don't have to leave just yet. On January 1st, we are starting off the 30 days of fire. Youth, forgive me. I said we weren't calling it that, but we are. 30 days of fire. Get ready. It's going to be exciting as we want to start the new year off right. More to come, but we are excited. January 12th and 13th is Hyphen Conference. See Brother Kyle or Sister Emma. And January 12th is a youth hangout. See me or Sister Anna. Actually, find Sister Anna. And last but not least, least January 28th we're having foot washing and communion this is one of those services church we don't miss these there's only a few we don't want to miss foot washing and communion worship with us as we sing I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is 
is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety. To every soul.
just want to speak the name of Jesus. Of Jesus. I get it. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your friends. I speak Jesus. Somebody declare that name. Declare the name of Jesus. Just speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name. Holy Just shout Elijah. the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus. There's nothing that he can There's do. There's nothing higher than the name. There's no one that he can I save. I he saved me. He saved me. Yeah. Oh. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the sea. Jesus in the darkness over every day. I will your name today God your name is high and lifted up today Jesus come on church worship the name of Jesus today he's worthy he's worthy Acts 4 and 12 says there is no other name there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved and that name is Jesus the name of Jesus is above all other names. So we sing unto him today. Come on, put your hands together with the choir. Say, neither, neither there is no one. Even unto men, under, even unto men, under heaven, even unto, oh yes, whereby, whereby we must, say neither, there is no other. Given unto men, given unto men, whereby, whereby we must be saved. 
Oh, everything we do in word or in deed, we do it in the name, holding fast, taking heed. Except a man be born of the water, except a man be born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Sing it out, tenor. I've got this revelation I'm standing on a firm foundation He washed away my sins And now I'm born again In Jesus' name In Jesus' name I'm standing on a firm foundation He washed away my sin And now I'm born again In Jesus' name We must be saved In Jesus' name Somebody call on that name today For he's worthy to be praised Call on the name I've got this revelation I'm standing on a firm foundation He washed away my sin And now I'm born again Somebody call on his name today Call on the name Call on that name Call on the name in the middle of the midnight hour In Jesus' name today somebody call on the name today oh we worship you Lord glory to your mighty name Jesus there is none like you God and there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved that name is Jesus. It has always been Jesus. It will always be Jesus. We are not saved by the name of the Father or the Son or the Holy Ghost. That All those names are Jesus. One name, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The presence of the Lord is here today. I feel his spirit. I've felt it since I walked in during choir practice. I heard the choir speaking in tongues and praying and the Holy Ghost moving. The Lord is here today. Amen. 
Amen. We want to welcome everybody to the Pentecostal Church today. Whether you're a first-time guest or a long-time member, why don't we give everybody a hand? We are so glad that you are here. And those of you that are watching online, we hope you have a good reason not to be here. We thank all of those that have texted and called and let us know there are several that are sick today. We want to keep those. Look around. If you don't see somebody that usually sits next to you, keep them in prayer this week that the Lord will touch them. There's a lot of stuff going around right now. Everybody seems to think they get COVID, but then they test and it's negative. So it's just, you know, that good old fashioned cold we all used to get before we called it a pandemic. That's politics. I don't get involved in that anyway. Hallelujah. We're so grateful to be in the house of the Lord. Pastor and Sister Hurst are ministering today at Brother Fair's church over in the valley. We're so grateful that our pastor is able to go out and share his wisdom with others. We have such a good pastor. I know they're not here, but why don't we give Pastor and Sister Hurst a hand? I love seeing all the young people running. I, I say young people, but I mean children. There was a couple young people that ran. But I, I love seeing their enthusiasm for worship. I, I trust that all of our parents are teaching those children what that means. We don't just want to do laps in the congregation. We do it for a purpose. It's a form of worship. I love seeing the sincerity and the honest heartedness of our children. And uh, if you're a parent in this church, please encourage your children to be a part of worship. It's for everybody. It doesn't have an age limit. We all need to be involved in worship. Amen. So glad for the spirit of worship that is here today. The choir has done such an amazing job. The praise team has done an incredible job. There is nowhere else I would rather be today. You may be seated this morning. It's such a privilege to be in this pulpit in the absence of our pastor. I, I, I wouldn't have any other job that I would rather do than be your executive pastor. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be able to fulfill that role. I am so thankful to be a part of this body of believers. Give yourself a hand. You're amazing. Now, today I'm going to continue to teach and to preach on an important topic that I started a couple of Wednesdays ago. For all of our first-time guests, we're so glad that you could be here. We want to encourage you to come again. We want you to be here on Wednesday, we have the banquet next Sunday, we've got then another Wednesday, and then it's, it's the can Christmas by candlelight, and then we have our last full service on December 31st. So the holidays are in full swing, we understand it's going on, but we want to encourage you to come back every opportunity that you get. I want to talk today with our church family, and in the hearing of everybody on the internet and all who are here today, about giving. Pastor and I were talking in his office earlier this week, and uh, he was saying, you know, I'm so excited to see the other half of the lesson that you started a couple Wednesdays ago, uh, this coming Wednesday. And I said, Pastor, why wait till Wednesday? I said, in fact, we have more people on Sunday that need to hear us talk and teach and preach about giving than just Wednesday night. We love everybody that comes to our church, but about half don't on Wednesday. And so I said, let's do this on Sunday. And he thought about it for a second. He said, you know what? You're right. Go ahead. So here I am. Now, that's a whole other sermon right there about church attendance on Wednesdays. And I could get up and I could preach it, but I digress. I will not. We are deep in the holiday season now. I mean, we're deep, folks. Some of us have actually gotten around to putting up our trees some of my neighbors have so many inflatables that I must believe they are rich because those things are expensive. And they just got a yard full of inflatables. Some of us have actually got around to putting that tree up, getting it decorated and trying to keep the pets out of it. Boy, that's an adventure. For all you cat owners out there, sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on your tree. It helps. We have a kitten that just loves dangly things and it's doing a pretty good job. I remember last year, we had our tree up before Thanksgiving for the early celebratory crowd. I believe in early Christmas celebrations. 
My family, my mother years ago started a ban on Christmas music until October. No Christmas music allowed from December 31st to October. That was the ban. And it was because my dad would be whistling Christmas carols all over the house all year long, and it drove her crazy. My wife thought that was a great idea, so she adopted that for our family. And so I, I look forward all year to October 1st, and then I get to start listening to Christmas music. Such a great season. There's also going to be the, the, the late bloomers, the folks that are out there on Christmas Eve trying to find what's left at the tree lots. They're just hoping that Walmart's got one more fake tree available in a box. If they could just get it up Christmas Eve night, it's going to be okay. I may or may not have been that person once or twice. Many of us at this time of year have Amazon accounts that are screaming for mercy, <laughs> leading to the most intense and frustrating delivery season of the year. UPS, FedEx, USPS, DHL, and Amazon Logistics are working around the clock, struggling to try and keep up with the demand generated by our gift giving. Yet this year, I have made a strange observation. In the last two weeks, I've been both to the Gilroy Outlets and the mall in San Jose. After 5 p.m. Wow. Sounds brave, right? Yeah. Nope. Looks like the raptures happened at the mall. There's nobody there at 5 p.m. I even hung around. Me and my wife walked around for a little while. She had some appointments this week. And we're walking around Friday evening at the mall. And there's nobody there. That's a strange thing. But it's in this season that we're often reminded it is more blessed to give than receive. And that's true. It is more blessed to give than receive. But I want to talk about a different kind of giving today. I want to talk about our offerings. Now, I know nobody's going to jump up and shout and run the aisles and hang from the chandeliers when I talk about offerings. But this is an important part of being a Christian. And it's something that we probably don't talk about enough. So we're going to get it today. If you weren't here on Wednesday the 29th when I talk about the tithe, talked about the tithe, you need to take the initiative to go and watch or listen. It is available on our website, in our app, and we're not just apostolic. We even have an app for our Google friends. We love the Android people too. We love everybody. We even love the flip phone crowd. God bless you. May I one day return to your stage of life. You can get that lesson online at our app, our website, or on YouTube where we are much more popular right now. Understanding the tithe and why we do it, that's our personal responsibility. We have to take the initiative and find out why we do that. We don't get to stand before the Lord in judgment and shrug our shoulders about it. Go back, even if you've been living for God for 200,000 years, go back and listen or watch and refamiliarize yourself with it. There is a blessing of obedience that comes when we pay our tithes, when we allow the Lord to be in control of our finances. But there are also consequences for failing to practice this principle that ex ex uh, has existed, got a little tongue tied there, before the law of Moses, in the law of Moses, and afterward. We have examples all over scripture, but go listen to it. I'm not going to re-preach it. Today, let's talk about offerings. And let's start with the main text that I used on Wednesday, Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. And this is one of those verses of Scripture. I love it because God is this complex being. He has moods. He has preferences. He has likes and dislikes. And, and in the modern church, we've created this image of this warm, fuzzy, froofy God who's sitting there like this wise old sage with a long beard dragging on the ground. And he's just like, my grace. And while a part of that is true, there is grace and there is forgiveness and he died for our sins and there's all of that good stuff. There is this side of God that is kind of serious. 
he kind of, there's stuff he doesn't really play games with. He has definitive likes and dislikes. Let's look at Malachi 3 and 8. Will a man rob God? Well, that's some strong preaching right there. Will, oh, hang on, I almost forgot. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? This is going to be the phrase echoed across the judgment. When we're all standing before the Lord after the rapture of the church and after the end of the world and, and we're getting ready to go into eternity and we stand at the white throne judgment, we're going to hear this so many times. People are going to go, wherein have we robbed thee? How was I a robber, God? In tithes and offerings. Oh, preachers are always talking about money. No, we haven't talked about tithes and offerings in this church for like two years. We don't talk about money all the time. But God does have requirements for how we handle our finances. And it's important, it's as important as having the Holy Ghost that we participate in God's economy. It's essential. You're never going to hear somebody get up and say, well, you might, you're hearing it today. Somebody get up and say that you ought to be a part of God's economy in order to get to heaven. I don't believe you can make it if God labels you a robber. I don't believe you can make it if he calls you a thief. But we're not talking about tithe today. He didn't just say we were robbers if we didn't tithe. He said, you have robbed me in tithe and offerings. Most Christians are pretty familiar with the concept of tithe and offering. But for those who may not be, I want to start with the same question that I started on the 29th. What are offerings? Our offerings are any amount we give above and beyond the tithe. The tithe is not the offering. And the offering is not the tithe. Those are two separate things. And both of them are essential to being a follower of Christ. The offering is a free will gift for which there is no mandatory amount. Now, I love humanity. We have, we have the best mindsets. When you say there's no mandatory minimum, that minimum becomes zero. That's just our mindset. We're like, oh, no, you can just give whatever you want. And we're like, okay, nothing. What is that about our nature that we just, that's how we see things. And then, then the government walks by and says, I will take 40% of your paycheck. Thank you very much. And you will like it. Well, you pop your tires on the potholes in 101 that could lose a passenger bus. And then when we get up and we talk about giving in the church, we go, ah! Now, for years, our church has practiced the 10, 5, and 2 principle. Well, what is that? It breaks down like this. A 10% tithe, a 5% offering, and 2% to missions. This is easy math. If I get a paycheck that's $100 after the government took the other $2,500, then on that $100, I would tithe $10. $10. That's my 10%. Now, how do I get the rest? Well, I cut the tithe in half. So $5. And then I cut it in half again. And it's $2.50. It's very easy math. I, I love easy math. I, somebody who has been an engineer for almost 20 years, I am not good at math, folks. It's not my forte. People are like, oh, how do you design software without math? I go, the computer does it for me. Somebody else did that math, so I wouldn't have to. This is what 10, 5, and 2 is. Now, if you're curious about where the tithe goes and what it happens to it, go listen to the last lesson. Mm -hmm. It's online, available for everybody. While a 5% offering out of our income isn't necessarily scripturally mandated, there are plenty of people in this building today that can testify to the blessings that come with a 5% offering. You see, the blessings of the Lord, the ones where he does all the really cool stuff, that doesn't come out of the tithe. That's a blessing of obedience. 
When you're obedient and giving your tithe, the Lord says, okay, whatever's left is yours. The downside being, if you're not faithful in that, then he takes what's left. Other ways. But the blessing of the offering is, God, I have already given you what was yours. Now, please take what's mine. I want to give what, some of what I have left to you of my own volition, my own free will. I learned the blessings of giving offerings a long time ago, most impactfully from my parents. Growing up in the church, we didn't have a lot. And it became a running joke from my dad every year that this year was going to be slim pickings. And feast or famine, man, when it came Christmas time, dad would walk into the living room with his hand in his pocket and go, well, slim pickings this year. And me and my sister would go. And my mom would sit there in the doorway and just cross her arms and shake her head. Whether it was a good year or a bad year, it was going to be slim pickings. And I am proud to have carried that tradition on myself. And my dad is still doing it today. I promise you, when my sister gets into town and we're all hanging around together, dad's going to look at the family and go, well, y'all, it's slim pickings this year. But I watched my parents faithfully give offerings even when their finances were in ruin. I didn't grow up in a preacher's home, folks. I'm just a man. I feel like there's a song in there somewhere. Maybe I'll write it one day. But I'm just a man. And I watched my mom and dad, who were just saints in the church, faithful people, always give. When my dad's business partner drove their company into the ground, and then stuck him with the bill. They continued to be faithful. When they lost their house in the aftermath, they continued to be faithful. And every year, in spite of the warnings of upcoming slim pickings, the Lord always provided. He always blessed. He always made a way. Now, were we rolling in money? <laughs> no. We were not. We didn't get expensive or lavish gifts. Good night. I miss the days of, of my youth when you could just get a G.I. Joe and that was the best thing in the world. Now it's like, Daddy, I want a PS5. I need a $400 MetaQuest, please. Let's talk about my first car. You're seven. Let's talk about it anyway. Take me back to the days of the G.I. Joe. But there was always enough, always something there. The bills were always paid. There was always food in our bellies. And even as an adult, when I started to experience slim pickings of my own, I have found that if I am faithful in my giving, not only do I always have what I need, but oftentimes I have a little bit more. I can hear some people now, but Brother Matt, I do give my offerings, and God has never blessed me. Are you sure about that? You know, we often equate God's blessings to monetary recompense. Well, God, I gave you $5. You ought to give me 10 There's a lot of other ways God blesses us. To have our children living for God, to have health in our bodies, to have gas in our cars, and food on our tables. God's blessings are so much bigger than money. I would challenge anybody who says God hasn't blessed me. What is your spirit when you give? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7 because I believe in preaching from the word. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. How are we giving? I, I love when pastor says you can't outgive God because he's right. You can't outgive God. However, if you walk up and say, okay, God, 
I'm going to give you money and you're going to give me money back. God's just kind of going to go, ha! you can't tell me what to do. What is our spirit? Are we giving it grudgingly? Are we giving it with an expectation of return? Or are we giving cheerfully? I, I got to a place finally in my life where when I sat down to write the offering check, I thought, man, I am so glad I can do this. Thank God that there's enough money in my account to be able to put this in the offering plate. And, and Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you have given me that have allowed me to be able to give this money back to you. I, I know I don't have to, but I get to. And, and I want you to have it because you've been so good to me, God. Amen. At the very least, he's given me the ability to give. When we give, we're instructed to do it with gladness, for God has given us the ability to do so. And as good stewards of his blessings, we have the wonderful opportunity to give back to him out of the abundance he has poured out on us. Let me tell you what that abundance looks like. I am not one of those health and prosperity preachers. That's false doctrine. But when you are faithful to God, we can have things like Miracle Mondays. Well, we have a group of people in this church that is so faithful. Every Monday they come and pray and nobody makes them. It's voluntary. And then they come in and they take your needs and their needs and the needs of anybody else that's brought and they sincerely bring it before the Lord. And time after time after time, God has answered prayers. And he has done that because those men and women, they're faithful and they give and they have faith and God responds to faith. That's abundance. So why give offerings then? If it's not mandatory... Why should I do it? I can always hear that one voice out there, and I know that it's somewhere. It's either in the building or on the Internet, because it was in my own head at one time. If the offering amount isn't set, then why give one at all? It's a great question. The answer is simple. Because our greatest blessings come from our giving. Not the commandment of the tithe, but of the free will giving. And on top of that, like pastor says, and I already mentioned it's true, God will always return what we invest in him. Always. Look with me in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38, because I know you want to know where I get that in the Bible. So do I. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, Pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Notice, he's not talking about the tithe here. For with the same measure ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. It's not the tithe. It starts with give. We pay our tithe. It's our due to God. But we give our offerings. There are more people here today than just my parents that could come and testify about the efficacy of this. They could bend your ear about it for a while, and if you ever get a chance, go ask my dad about challenging God with giving and seeing the Lord respond with the impossible as much. Not long ago, pastor started a symbolic offering. Does anybody remember that? It wasn't that long ago. It feels like a long time ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. And the offering plates were starting to look weird just sitting there empty. Everybody gives online, right? I hope. Those fees are no joke, so I hope we're giving online. And, and, and so the plates were sitting here looking sad, and pastor said, you know what, why don't we symbolically as a church, why don't we just come up and drop something in that plate so we can teach others that giving is a part of worship. It is a part of worship. When we say, God, I'm going to surrender this thing that you don't demand I surrender to you, that is worship. 
Whether that's my time or my money or my energy, whatever it is, when I surrender something unto God that is not demanded of me, I am worshiping him. I made sure I dropped my dollar in there. And I've started getting dollar bills out so I can do my symbolic offering. And a lot of Sundays I'll throw a check in there again because I want, I want my giving to be visible. Not, not so you'll give me any kind of accolade, but so that I can say, Lord, this is my worship unto you. I want to do this as a form of worship. Now what happened is it turned into this cute little thing with our kids. And there's nothing wrong with kids giving. That's something that we should teach our children. We ought to just put in our kids that that giving is a form of worship. It's important. It's a part of who we are. But our symbolic offering turned into this cute little moment where the kids come up and drop things in the plates and the adults sit in their seats and go, oh, that's so adorable. That's not the intent. It's worship. How are we worshiping when the children give? Teach them how to give. Yes, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. But what about us? I've... I'm mixed on technology, folks. I've I've worked in it for years. It's an important part, I believe, of modern day ministry. But it's also taken things that were worshipful and meaningful and symbolic, and it said, you know what? We don't need those. I don't have to go to church. I can just watch on the internet in my pajamas with peanut butter and jelly stains down my shirt. You're not worshiping nothing. By all means, if you're sick and can't come to church, don't come to church sick. I don't want your germs. Watch on the internet. But we all know, we all know with honesty, if we're not lying to ourselves, that church online is not the same as church in person. God can move anywhere, but we have to be in an atmosphere created for him to move in. That doesn't happen in our living rooms. Not generally. So giving has become one of those online things that we do a lot. And I don't, it's convenient. I would rather you give online than not at all. Don't go to hell over, the, over online giving. But we should still participate in the worship of giving. We should approach our giving as a form of glory unto God. Our offerings are critical to the operation of the church. Without faithful offering givers, the the doors of the church can't stay open. People don't give offerings, we don't have church. This light bill is expensive. And I have done everything I can. I have put LEDs in everywhere. I have energy efficiented all the things. I've gone through this place week after week and checked to make sure nobody left a light on in a closet somewhere. We're doing everything we can to be good stewards, but if we don't pay the lighting and heat bill and we don't pay the water bill, can't have church. All of that happens from the cheerful generosity of the saints. And I wouldn't stand before you today and ask you to do something that I don't do myself. The Lord would have some pretty severe consequences for me if I got up in this pulpit and was a hypocrite and demanded that you give and you tithe while I sit at home and eat fried chicken and play golf. I can't eat fried chicken. It makes me fat and it's too cold to play golf. So I think I'll just be faithful. I've lived it in my life and I can tell you that the blessings that have been poured out on my life over the years have all come from the mercy of God and the blessing that comes with my free will offering. And I wouldn't say it if I couldn't find it in scripture. So let's talk about where it comes from. Like tithing, offerings have their origin in the Bible, going all the way back to the Old Testament and carrying forward into the modern church. I mentioned that excuse last time. People say, well, that was something from the Old Testament. I'm sorry, friend. A lot of those things carried forward. It didn't change. The law of Moses, gone. But the stuff we're talking about was pre-Moses. And it's still in effect. Let's look at Exodus chapter 25 and verse number 2. Exodus 25 and verse 2. 
It says, speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Now to give you some context for this scripture, Israel is freshly escaped from bondage in Egypt. They just got out of there. And the Lord instructs Moses to take an offering. Hey, I just delivered you from bondage. Take an offering. Why? Because God said so. Israel had spoiled the entire nation of Egypt. They borrowed gold and jewels and money and all this stuff from the Egyptians. And when they left, God said, okay, now that I've given you all of this abundance, return it. Some of it. And the the people of Israel, they they get this spirit of giving on them. It, It just takes a hold of the entire nation. And they start to give. Look at Exodus chapter 36 and verse number five. Exodus 36 and 5. It says, And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. Moses, they're giving too much. We don't know what to do with all this surplus. The people have this great spirit of giving. Can you imagine with me for a second? I would love. It would make my, not my day, not my week, my life to get up in front of the church with pastor one day and say, folks, y'all got to stop giving so much. It's too much. We can't spend it all. Give me that problem, Moses. That would be a much more enjoyable encounter than having to come up and make a plea to meet some of the church's basic needs. And like I mentioned before, unlike the tithe, there is no set amount for offerings. I touched on the idea of giving 5%, but the Bible doesn't define the amount. That's just a principle that a lot of us have taken a mantle for and have followed. As far as giving being necessary... The scripture says this in Deuteronomy 16 and verse number 17. Deuteronomy 16 and 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The principle here, give what you're able. Give what you're able. Now God, he understands that people live in different stages of life and and people at the beginning often have less than people at the end and people in the middle are somewhere in between and he understands this. He doesn't expect us to give everything. He expects us to give as we're able, which means 5% for me might be a lot less than 5% for somebody else. Or it might be a lot more. It just depends on who it is. and and what their phase of life is at that time. It doesn't matter what the dollar amount is. It matters that it is done freely as worship. If you can give 1%, do it. I think most of us can probably do better than that. There's some nice cars in the parking lot. But if we can only do 1%, then do that. If you can do 5%, please do. Can you do more? That's a matter of your ability and and your willingness to do that unto God. I'm not going to tell you to or not to. It's a matter of, of prayer and ability. But the fact that we need to give is plain. The amount isn't as important as the act. If I don't give it all, where's my worship? Well, I waved my hands while the singer sang. Really? That's your worship? That's the best that you can give God? I bet if we went to a ball game or something, you'd do a lot more than do just this. It's worship. Look in Luke chapter 21. 
verses 1 through 4. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And I know that talking about giving makes people uncomfortable. I get it. That discomfort is usually conviction. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast into the offerings of God. But she of her penury, that word penury there means poverty, hath cast in all the living that she had. Look at Jesus' praise for this widow woman. That's a great example to us because he's talking about the wealthy people at the, t- at the, the synagogue and they're throwing money into the offering plate and they're, they're making a big show of it. You know, there was, there, there's not always, but I've grown up at times where there was the brother who'd come in and he'd make a big display of taking out his wallet and he pulls out a $100 bill and goes, and puts it in the plate. Did you see my hundred? He's got 35 more in his wallet, but he gave one. And then he won't tithe or, or give offerings. Good for you. You're giving out of your abundance. Huh. Jesus is focused on this woman who has nothing. She has so little. That's why we can't get a mentality, well, I don't have enough to give. Look at that woman. She had two Mites. That'd be like you and me having two bucks. And I've been there a time or two where that was all I had. And she takes those $2 bills and she drops them in the giving box. And Jesus says, look at her. She's your example. She didn't give out of her abundance. She gave out of her love. She gave it because she wanted to return unto God the things that he had done in her life. And and nobody else there could see how she was blessed. Nobody else could see the things that God had done in her life. But she gave because she loved to give. And she wanted to return unto God all that he had given unto her. It wasn't some ornate display. They didn't play the song while she danced down the aisle and put her two mites in. It wasn't something she did for credit or recognition. She simply did it as a form of worship. I'm not up here today telling you that you need to empty your bank account and throw it in the offering plate. That'd be silly. Unless God tells you to do it and then it'd be silly not to. But I'm not telling you to do it. I'm trying to show you that when you give, when you do it unto the Lord, he takes notice. It it catches his attention. When we open our hand, instead of hold it tight like it's a death grip on every penny, he starts to go, I could put something in there. I I could do something with an open hand. Can't put nothing in here. It's also a measure of our faithfulness. How we give can be a gauge of how faithful we are. Now, I started this lesson talking about stewardship, and that's going to continue all the way through here. If we are good stewards, we give. If we're not, we don't. And if we don't give, the odds are pretty good that if we haven't already stopped paying our tithes, we're on the way. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If I am going to be a good steward of what God has given me, I will be found faithful. I must be found faithful. It is required in stewards that we be found faithful. God gauges our faithfulness, not even in our church attendance, which some of us can work on, but in our giving. 
whether or not we are generous with him. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse number 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Look at what the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Corinth in verse number six. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. That doesn't mean amounts. If all I have to give is a dollar and I give it, that's not sparingly. But if I have a million dollars and I give a dollar, that's... It's pretty sparing. It caught, I, I spent more than that just putting a gas pump in my car. I don't even squeeze the handle. Just putting it in there cost me a dollar. If we do sparing giving, we reap sparing blessings. But he that sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. That means that if I say, God, I want to give this to you because I can. God's going to go, well, I'm going to give this to you because I can. I would love for a because I can spirit to get a hold of every believer in this place and in the world. Because if we gave just because we could, we could put the gospel in every corner of the universe. If I only give a dollar, knowing that I'm going to spend 50 on bad coffee at Starbucks this week, that's sparingly. But if I didn't drink coffee for that day and that was the only coffee I got that week and I threw it in the plate, that is generous. That's bountiful. God says in verse number eight, look at this. Or Paul says, God says through Paul, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. When we sow our giving, he sows grace in us. You know what grace looks like? Undeserved favor. Grace is the fact that without a college education, I went in to a degree-dominated industry where the guy sitting next to me had a master's degree in computer engineering and the dude down the hall had a PhD and I had a high school diploma. And we had the same job title. That's grace. That's when something is going on in my life and I, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm stuck in this situation and, and God says, here, let me get you out of that. That's grace. Because I sowed bountifully. I received bountifully. And, and at the very least, I got his grace out of the deal. Let's look at the NIV version of that verse. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 in the NIV and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There have been a lot of times in my life where I didn't have what I wanted. But there has never been a time where I didn't have what I needed. I have never gone hungry. I have never been homeless. I may have lost a lot of things, but I never lost my life. I may have lost a lot of stuff, but I never lost a meal. God has been there for me day after day after day, meeting need after need. He's faithful. I can't tell you how many times he's been good to me. All the times that I pulled up my bank account app and was like, why is there money in there? My bills were more than that. Yeah. 
Our blessings and provision are directly linked to our giving. And giving isn't just about us either. Here's the part where I like to get a little bit more excited. Giving goes to support others. Look with me in Acts chapter 11 and verse 29. Acts 11 and 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Move the mission. Mother's Memorial. Christmas for Christ. All the offerings that we give to support God's work around the world, not just here at home. On top of that, we've been challenged and been successful in building churches and Bible schools in other countries. How exciting is that? There are believers today that are filled with the Holy Ghost because we gave, because we said we can do this. We're going to give because we can. There will be people in heaven that we meet that we won't have prayed through, but we'll have sent a man with our money who could do it. I love how inspired our students and our hyphens have become over the years to give to these external causes. Our church has rallied. We've built those Bible schools. We've built those churches. We're building a parsonage in another church overseas right now. And this is a wonderful thing. We're spreading the gospel around the globe by participating in giving. Being able to dedicate that church and that Bible school in Santa Domingo in January changed my life, Brother Zion. I came back from that trip with a radically different mindset to be able to worship with people that had so little, but what I had went so far. And they loved God as much as I did. And and they needed him as much as I did. And in the service that I preached on an encounter with Jesus, the pastor of that church had his back healed. That changed me. Left a permanent mark on my spirit. And I can't wait to go to Nicaragua next year. It's going to be hot. And I'm going to be sweaty. And I've got to have security named Kyle. But I can't wait to see what God is doing with what we gave just because we could. It's a dream, a vision of mine that we would be the kind of church that every year has a missions trip where we open it up to everybody and say, this year we're dedicating this. Who wants to go? We can take 10 people and have them beating down my office door to be one of the 10 that gets to go on the missions trip that year. To see the latest work that we've built with our offerings. I promise that if you'll do it once, just once, you'll never not want to do it again. It's an exciting thing. When we're able to give $75,000 to missions work in one year and many thousands another year, it gives us a sense of pride. I know that our students and our hyphens are proud of the $25,000 offering they gave to move the missions last year. And they have every reason to be proud. Here's what I'm going to mess you up, though. But... What do you mean? That's a three-letter word. That means there's something else. But here's where this takes a turn. There is a much less glamorous part of giving. My friends, I believe in the blessings. I have have shouted the blessings unto you in this lesson. I, I I have come to you with excitement and talked about all the wonderful things that God has done in the blessings. But there's also a practical part. I've repeatedly referenced stewardship in this teaching and where we give our offerings is a part of stewardship. Believe it or not, keeping the lights on, the water running, our digital services bill paid, our fees 
for being in this business park, our $6,500 a month lease and all the things that are breaking down all the time. This AC that we run so liberally in the summer is some of the AC, the only AC that some people get in the summer. We live in California. We used to believe you didn't need one. Yeah, well, we do now. And some folks live in apartments that don't have air conditionings. And so they come early on Sunday because they don't want to fry eggs on their countertops. The heat that we run in the winter that keeps us all from getting a cold that will have an impact on our income, that costs money too. Besides, if I didn't have people texting me every 10 minutes in church that it's too hot or it's too cold, what would I do? How else would I spend my time? We all know I don't like being idle. Our app, our website, all of our live stream services, these things act in tandem to minister to people who are searching for the Lord using our live stream as a medium. Did you know that a part of the insanely expensive digital package we pay for includes SEO, search engine optimization, so that when you go and you search churches in Hollister on Google, we're one of the first results? People find our church that way. That's all possible because of faithful givers who help make it so. There are people in our church today because of those services. The man sitting on the, the organ right there came to this church after he watched us online for weeks to see if we were the kind of church that had what he was looking for. If we're building churches and Bible schools and giving record offerings to buy missionary vehicles, but the mother church can't pay the electricity, we are not good stewards. When we have to take up special offerings to pay the rent or to meet critical infrastructure needs, we are not good stewards. Well, Brother Matt, that took a turn. Yeah, it did. Because it's serious. Every week I sit there in the office with Pastor and Sister Hurst and we, and we work through the, the infrastructure of the church. Nobody's letting us here by grace. And we ought to be thankful for this building right here because do you know what it costs to lease commercial property right now? It would quadruple our rent to move. Not being able to meet those needs is not good stewardship. I'm not saying that we shouldn't give to missions. We should. But if we're giving to missions and not supporting the church at home, we are failing in our mission. What's our mission, Brother Matt? Is it to build churches overseas? No. My mission is to reach Hollister. The men and women outside the four walls of this church who are telling me that they've got this sickness and that sickness and that broken elbow and that busted rib and they need Jesus. That's our mission. We're called to minister to this city. We get to minister other places, but we're supposed to minister here. If I fund everything everywhere else, but I don't take care of the mission, then I am not a success. I have failed in my stewardship. My friends, it breaks my heart to walk around this church week after week and see things fall into disrepair. We need new carpet. We need new lights. We need to fix a pipe outside that's broken. I had to shut water off outside because we got a broken pipe. We just had to fix the baptistry because that pump went out. The baptistry needs to be rebuilt.
Because the limestone that's in it is crumbling into pieces. The work needs help. The work needs stewards. I can only do so much. It's not a one-man job. My family and I have carried the burden of, of subscription services this church has needed for years. I'll just pay it. Church can't afford it. I'll just pay it. I'll just pay it. Never, never seeking credit or reward. It's just this is the house of the Lord. These are the people of God. This is my mission. If it's not being taken care of, then what am I doing? Why am I here? What's the point? Oh, I would that we would get a heart for the mission. Not missions. We got a heart for that. I love missions. But what about the mission? Yeah. Our purpose. Yeah. Our calling. Our goal. Oh, that we would have the same passion that we send money out of the church to also keep what is needed here and take care of the church. It's worship. God, I love you. And I love your work and I'm thankful for what you've done for me. So here, take this. Your house needs it. Your work needs it. There's people that are, are being reached in the Spanish Bible class that I can't reach. And they need a space. So, so here's the money, cop. Let's do the mission. I want to be a good steward. I want to be a good steward. I have to be, I have to tithe to be saved. I get to give. I get to give. I wonder if we could stand all across this place right now. Oh, my God. Lord, I feel your presence right now. This moment has been made possible by the few. What could we do, my brother and my sister, with the many? What lives could be changed? What prayers could be answered? We don't pay to get our prayers answered. That, that's not how this works. But if we're generous with our giving to create the space and the opportunity and the moment that we're making right now, we're in a second, I'm going to invite you to come and to bring your needs before the Lord. Giving makes that possible. When I lay hands on you and the Lord hears my prayer and, and he, he answers and you're healed, it's because of faithful giving. If I wasn't faithful, he wouldn't listen. He sure wouldn't answer. I wonder if as a church this Sunday morning we could gather together in this altar and recommit ourselves to giving. Lord, not, not Pastor Matt, not Pastor Hurst. Lord, I'm going to tithe faithfully. Every time I get increased, God, I'm going to tithe faithfully. Every time I have an increase, God, I'm going to give faithfully my offerings. In it. And I'm going to make that commitment to you, God. And I'm going to stand here in this altar before you and my brother and my sister. And I'm going to say, God, I will give. 
I will be a good steward because you've been a good God and you've done so much for me that I cannot tell it all if we will do that together watch what he will do I invite you now to come let's come together as a church and recommit ourselves that you're going to be a good steward. Now, now let's worship him. Let's lift our hands all across this place as they sing and, and begin to worship the Lord for his goodness and all his faithfulness. Oh, he's been so good.
Thank you for being a part of our live stream today. We hope you've been blessed by our broadcast. Remember, you can visit us anytime at tpchollister.org or stay connected through the TPC Hollister app in the App Store and Google Play. From all of us at the Pentecostal Church, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.